This podcast is brought to you by The Empowerment Project. Research proves that empowerment self-defense training makes you safer, period. I want you to have a great self-defense toolkit so you can create strong boundaries, speak with confidence, and take up all the space that you deserve in the world. We'll hear stories from survivors and find out what worked for them and why. We'll interview leaders in the field and talk about tips, concepts, and really easy things that you could do to make yourself safer and interrupt the cycle of violence. I've taught self-defense classes for over 30 years, and I promise to teach you everything I know. Ultimately, I'm going to want you to get some in-person training, but a great empowerment self-defense class is more than just the physical skills. The list of things I want to teach you is endless, so let's get to it. My name is Sylvia Smart, and welcome to The Empowerment Project. Friends, since I recorded this episode, there have been yet more mass shootings. Notably, the Atlanta shooting, where eight people were murdered, six of whom were women of Asian descent. Six days later, ten people were killed in a shooting in Boulder, Colorado, inside, and in the parking lot of a grocery store. But there have been even more. Five killed in Rock Hill, South Carolina, six in Allen, Texas, five more in Essex, Maryland. Folks, the list goes on. Each of these shootings represents people who were killed, even more who were injured, and so many lives forever ended or upended. These mass shootings receive a lot of media attention in our country, but did you know that more than two-thirds of gun deaths in the U.S. are suicides? Gun violence, folks, it's a health crisis, and not just in our country. For example, Brazil, the U.S., Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, and Guatemala made up half of the gun deaths worldwide in 2016. Easy access to firearms. Firearms that are meant to kill people. Lax gun laws, mental health crises, toxic masculinity. These are just a few of the issues related to gun deaths. We've got to get a handle on this. I know you know that. There are so many people working together to make changes. Let's add our voices to support their efforts. Between now and when we finally end gun violence, if you want active shooter survival skill training, I offer classes on Zoom. You can go to my website, nagacommunity.com, N-A-G-A community.com, and you'll find a link to the upcoming classes and dates in the navigation bar if that's something that you're interested in. I don't like teaching these classes because, honestly, I can't stand thinking about it. But I do it because when you know what your options are and you act quickly, you can save lives. And that, my friends, makes this training vital. So listen to this episode, take my class, or find another class and get prepared. My hope, my deepest hope, is that you never need to know or use any of this. Okay, take a deep breath. And let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. In today's episode, I am going to tell you everything I know about how to survive an active shooter event. The likelihood of this happening to any of us is very slim, but knowing what to do and being able to act decisively and quickly is known to save lives. So, it's in that spirit that I present this episode on the Empowerment Podcast by Naga, Surviving an Active Shooter Event. This is my least favorite class to teach. I don't like that mass shootings are a thing. I wish that all of us lived in a world where these types of things never happened, but they do. So I go around to organizations and corporations whenever they ask, and I share with them what I know. My hope is that by doing these trainings, should one of us ever be in such a scenario that we know what it takes to stay safe and maybe even lead others to safety as well. I have a ground rule for you, which is take care of yourself. We'll have a few breathing breaks, but do whatever you need to do, knowing that this can be really hard stuff to think about and to learn about. I want to start with a disclaimer. 
I have sat in on trainings with the FBI and with a group called InfraGuard. I've done a lot of reading, watching training videos, talking, and reflecting about this topic. I do not represent any organization or anyone other than myself. And I want to let you know about links. I will be mentioning reports and training videos, and I will post links to all of the things I mention in the description of this episode. Also, the Empowerment Podcast by Naga has a corresponding Facebook group. Look for The Empowerment Project and answer the questions and we'll approve you as a group member. This is a safe space for you to ask questions and share your successes, but I want you to know I'll also post the links there as well. I wanted you to know before we really get started what my bias is in this talk, in this episode. I believe that we need to make some very big decisions about gun laws in our country. We need to think long and hard about the accessibility to firearms that make it possible for people to commit mass shootings. We need to look long and hard at the power NRA lobbyists hold over our lawmakers. We don't victim blame here. The fault, the blame lies squarely in the hands of the perpetrators, the shooters, and those who condone the laws, the attitudes, and the culture that enables these horrendous acts of violence to keep happening. Toxic masculinity is a huge part of why and how these atrocities continue. It needs to stop. That's my bias. And now I want to tell you what you can expect from this episode. First, I'm going to give you a quick history of active shooter scenarios in this country and how the FBI began its business of rolling out every time there is an active shooter event. I'll share with you facts and information. We'll talk about a profile and pre-attack behaviors. We're going to talk about preparation and planning, which is just like we do in like self-defense classes, empowerment self-defense classes. We're going to talk about the run, hide, fight model in particular and stop the bleed And we're going to end with some final notes. First, to start off with, we're going to talk about a brief history. And I'm going to start this history with Clackamas Town Center, which is actually here in Oregon where I live. And on December 11th, 2012, there was an active shooter incident that was happening while coincidentally the local FBI was running a training, an active training, just minutes away. So all of the FBI agents had their gear on. Their vehicles were all loaded up. They had everything ready to roll out. They heard on the news, on the radio, that this was happening very close to them, and they decided that they would go help. They could have gotten in a lot of trouble. Uh, This crime, this type of crime, did not have a federal nexus. And of course, the FBI is a federal agency, but they couldn't not go. So they went and sure enough, they showed up and they lent their support, their communications equipment, their talent, their energies, their training, and helped bring this situation to a close as quickly as possible. Well, interestingly and sadly, just a few days later on the 14th, so just three three days later in um, Connecticut, Sandy Hook happened. And in that instance, a bunch of kids and teachers were killed in that shooting incident. So this whole thing about active shooter and mass shootings was on everybody's mind. And as the FBI does, when they... Uh, participate in this type of activity, they are required to write up an incident report. So they wrote up an incident report on the Clackamas Town Center shooting and how they were at a training and how they decided to go support and what they did. That incident report made it up the chain of command and landed on President Barack Obama's desk in the White House. And 
with Congress and a ton of support of Congress because these two incidents had occurred so closely together and so many people were crying out. The White House initiative called Now is the Time was put into the the law with Congress supporting it and funding it. Now is the Time assigned the FBI to find ways to support state, local, tribal, and campus law enforcement officers who might have to deal with an active shooter incident. And part of that charge is to do trainings and outreach across the country. So now, every time there's an active shooter incident, the FBI rolls out and lends its support and what they know to the local law enforcement who are on the ground handling it to begin with. Let's talk about what an active shooter incident is. An active shooter is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. The event is unpredictable and it evolves very quickly. So knowing what to do and making fast decisions can save lives. And that's why even though I don't like to do these presentations, I do them because It can save lives if we, God forbid, any of us is in this situation, if we have heard some of this stuff, we have thought about it and what we might do to respond, then perhaps we have a chance to stay safe and possibly to help someone else. And it is important for us to talk about this kind of thing because 60% of incidents of these active shooter incidents end in five minutes or less with about a third ending in less than two minutes. So it's fast. But the average emergency response time varies from community to community, but it's about 6 to 12 minutes. So if most of these incidents are done in less than five minutes, but the average response time for emergency people is 6 to 12 It means that it's people like us who are on the scene, who know what to do, who may help keep ourselves and one another as safe as possible. I want to give you just a few facts. 70% of active shooter incidents happen in a business or an educational environment. Many incidents happen in small and medium-sized towns where law enforcement have limited staff and resources. 10% of the time, the motivating factor had something to do with violence against women or one woman with whom they at once had a romantic relationship. That's the inciting factor. Let's talk about who's the target. Most of the time in the past, shooters victimized young and old, male and female, family members and people of all races, cultures and religions, whoever was there. In the past, victims were most often selected at random. But we've had a few incidents recently where this does not seem to be the case. For example, the shooting at the Pulse nightclub in 2016 targeted our LGBTQ plus population. The Walmart shooting in El Paso in 2019 targeted our community of folks with brown skin. Let's call these shootings what they were, mass shootings, That were also hate crimes. So this is something we need to really talk about. Take a deep breath. Take another one. It's tough. It's tough to think about this stuff and talk about it. Let's keep going, though. So how do these scenarios tend to resolve? About two-thirds of the incidents are over before police arrive. And people who are there actually end it, or the shooter flees or commits suicide. About one-third of the time, law enforcement and the shooter exchanged gunfire, and the shooter is killed or taken into custody. 13% of the time, the incidents ended after unarmed citizens like you and me safely and successfully restrained the shooter. Only 3% of these incidents ended after an armed individual who was not law enforcement exchanged gunfire with the shooter. I like to mention this last statistic because gun advocates use this reasoning that you may have heard before, quote, 
it just takes one good person with a gun to stop a bad person with a gun. And our statistics simply don't bear that out. Let's talk about an active shooter profile. There actually is no true profile, but there are behaviors that we can keep an eye out for. And we'll talk about what those look like in just a second. In school shootings, though, the shooter is usually a student there or has been in the past. In shootings that take place in businesses, the shooter usually has a relationship there, like they were an employee or they are an employee or their spouse or ex-spouse is an employee. And ages of the shooter, it's all over the place. It's 13 to 88 years old. Most are males and most act alone. And most are white males, to be clear. Often there does seem to be this sort of lone wolf aspect to their personality, their social isolation. I think it's really important to talk about misogyny and the shooter. This is what I was talking about earlier, this toxic masculinity. And I will have a link to this article that was in the New York Times in the places where I said I'd have links. But here is the quote. The motivations of men who commit mass shootings are often muddled, complex, or unknown. But one common thread that connects many of them other than access to powerful firearms, is a history of hating women, assaulting wives, girlfriends, and female family members, or sharing misogynistic views online. So after that one, I do need to take a deep breath. Because that really just pisses me off. All right, we're going to keep going. Let's talk about pre-attack behaviors. So, like I said, there's not a real profile as far as I know and have been trained, but there are these pre-attack behaviors that are observable behavior changes that we can keep our eyes peeled for. So, for example, an unresolved real or perceived grievance leading to depression and feeling feelings of victimization. Oh, everybody hates me or the girls don't like me. No one understands me. Those kinds of behaviors. Writings, often called manifestos. And these writings can be online or on social media. They could be on the perpetrator's computer. They could be handwritten on a, a pad. There is definitely the acquisition of weapons, lots of weapons, powerful weapons. This amassing of weapons is a behavior that has been seen. There's a fascination with previous attacks. There's research and obsession with attackers going back to Columbine and uh, just someone who talks about it or perseverates about it or wants to um, look it up or go to the library and read about it. There are often mental health issues or contact with professionals that has been a key sort of component to the, the shooter themselves, like a, a thread this thread runs through these mental health issues, this contact with professionals in the past. Sometimes a loss precipitates the shooting, like the death of a parent or um, some close friend or a recent divorce or loss of a girlfriend. And the shooter feels like there's no place to turn for help or that if they did turn for help, no one would understand them anyway. So there is something to mention here about drug use as well. So if our perpetrator is a drug user, they will often stop using for days or even weeks before their planned shooting because they want to stay focused. And sometimes even that will hold true for prescribed medication. If they, if they have a prescription, they might stop taking them. Then there's this ideation of violent resolutions that eventually moves from thought 
to research, to planning and prep. So something that someone mentions and maybe thinks about sometimes turns into actually going to the library, going on Google, starting to write that manifesto and making some plans and gathering weapons and looking at schedules and trying to figure out the best time and actively preparing. Another pre-attack behavior is extreme recklessness. So driving really fast or swerving around on the highway on a motorcycle because they're getting ready to die anyway. And they're just feeling, I don't want to use the word feeling because I don't know, but it seems that that behavior has something to do with being imbalanced and this plan that they're hatching. And then oftentimes, um, as especially as agencies go back and look at all of the things that were happening before the shooting, they find that there has been violence toward a family member or toward a caregiver or someone in their very close circle. And that can be a telltale sign. Let's talk about Umpqua Community College, the shooting that happened there in October of 2015. The shooter there, that was here in Oregon as well, the shooter there had a manifesto, which hasn't been published, but it was very thick. It described a very disturbed kid living in a world of failed relationships, girls not responding to his advances, feeling isolated, different, and oppressed. Oppressed, right? Like, victimized, like I mentioned before, like no one understands me, no one gets me, the girls don't like me. So this shooter went into the classroom and handed that manifesto in a manila envelope to one of the students in the class and told them to go outside to the front of the school and to wait there until officers arrived and to hand them his manifesto. And then he proceeded to shoot in the classroom. But FBI and other law enforcement got access to this manifesto and they have poured over it with a fine tooth comb looking specifically, well, at all the information and all the data and all of the behaviors, but looking also for where there could have been some community intervention as prevention. Sheriff Hanlon, who was the the officer in charge at the scene said in hindsight, he wished that he had been aware of all the people in his community who need a friend, who are feeling this way, who feel misunderstood, and that his what one of the things that he really has wanted to do is to create a different kind of community with more safety nets. Um, as we know, people are all sorts of good and bad. And this is also a person who um, described Sandy Hook as being fake, that it didn't really happen, that it was all uh, for show. And he also does not believe in gun control. So I don't know that that information that I have is maybe older. He may have changed his tune by now. I don't know. But we're all a kind of a mixture of all sorts of things. And so he uh, can hold these two beliefs about prevention, about taking care of people in the community, and also not believing that another shooting actually happened. Let's talk about threat assessment because it works. And what do I mean by that? Threat assessment is when people can come together and have confidential conversations about concerning behaviors they notice. For example, People at schools and businesses can meet together and share information about students or employees that are maybe doing odd things or exhibiting possible red flags. So us, people, like us, bystanders, we're in the best situation to detect and recognize these behaviors at a very local level. And as you know, one of our self-defense tools, one of the most important ones, is to communicate. By telling and speaking up. So when we speak up, when our body is warning us that something's wrong, when we're noticing behaviors that are off, red flags, by telling, 
that helps to keep us safer, but it can also go a long, long, long way towards helping others stay safer too. We can help create safer communities. Successful threat management includes a lot of long-term care. Uh, It's a huge conversation and one that is ongoing, and it's a multitude of mental health care, social services that can come together and really provide safety net. We need the funding for that. We really, really need to create safer communities. But threat assessment does work when people are talking with one another. The recommendation from the FBI is if you hear something, say something. If you know something, say something, which makes sense. And I've talked here about planning. You know my story if you've heard my other episodes about fire drills. Fire drills work. Fire drills work because we go through our plan. We go through the steps. We go down the hallway. We follow in single file formation out the door, down the hallway, down the stairs, meeting our teacher out in the corner of the playground. And we practice that over and over again when we're not scared. And then when we're scared, because there's a fire, there's smoke, and we can't see, we hear someone yelling, we hear sirens, we see flames. Even though we're scared, our body knows what to do because we've practiced and we've planned and that kicks in. So there's nothing different then fire drills and self-defense and preparation and planning and fire drills, I already said that, and um, an active shooter and just knowing what seems to keep people safe and leads to success with getting out. So the FBI recommends run, hide, fight, this model of run, hide, fight. And that since that is the program that they endorsed, That's the one that I'm going to talk about. But the point is, the more we plan and train, the better prepared we're going to be. So what about you as a planner? Think about it. Talk about it. If it's on you, what are you going to do? What are you or aren't you comfortable with? Think through and recognize what your tools and strengths are, because all of us are going to have different strengths and different tools, right? If you work in a specific building and you and I are there, you're going to know where the exits are and how to best get out or where to hide, whereas I might be a little more like, I don't know where the best place is, but you might know. So we all have our own strengths and skills. Consider that you will have to be willing to make a decision and a very quick one. Because remember, I'm going to say this again, making a quick decision and taking action saves lives in active shooter scenarios. We can practice going through situations in our mind. Become a planner. And what do I mean by that? Be aware of your surroundings. This is a self-defense strategy, right? Just know where you are. Know where the exits are. Know where the stairs are. If you're in any given building at the movies or in a new building giving a presentation downtown. Know, you know, if you're out um, and... The store you're in a mall and stores are starting to close down know where the lights are on which stores you know where are the exits out to the street this is our self defense as an example i like to use this one when you fly someplace on a plane actually listen to the safety presentation i want you to be the one who looks around and knows where the nearest exit is you know how they say like sometimes the nearest exit may be behind you i want you to be the person who sort of sits up in your seat and looks in front of you to check out where the exits are and you turn around and you look behind you to see where those exits are and you figure out which one is closest so Maybe you can be the person who points everyone to the nearest exit or at least know which one is quicker so you can get out, right? This is safety. It's not paranoia. It's just planning. So run, hide, fight is the exact same premise. When you work through your plan, you act with purpose. Like you decide quickly, all right, I'm going to run. Then you run, right? You don't doubt yourself. You don't second guess. You just do it. Take a break. A little breath here. You're doing great. You're sticking with me. Thank you. 
Let's talk about run, you know, this option of running. So you're going to have an escape route and a plan in mind, wherever you are in whatever building. Like if I need to get out, elevators don't work. There's the hallway. That's the way I'm going because there are stairs at the end. You want to leave your stuff behind, your belongings. You want to just not worry about your purse, not worry about your backpack or your coat. You just want to pick up your body and run. You're going to evacuate regardless of whether others agree to follow, which I know for you and me may be really hard because we're going to want to convince other people to come with us. But what they recommend to us is just get out. If you can, help others escape if possible, but don't tarry. Don't stick around trying to have a discussion. Just say, really, you got to run. Follow me, right? Let's go. Don't stop to help the wounded, which again, for you and me, may be kind of hard. But when we stop to help the wounded, we're putting another life on the line, which is our own. And they really want us to just get out. Don't attempt to move the wounded because this is a crime scene and it's the same reason that will slow us down. We've got to go. If we're running down a hallway and we see other people running toward us, but if we heard the gunshots and we know where they are and we're running away, then see if you can keep other people from running towards the gunshots, right? Turn them. Say the shots are being fired down to the left. Turn around. Run with me this way. Let's get to the exit as fast as we can. Keep your hands visible as you leave the building. So chances are good that law enforcement won't even be there yet. But just in case they are, you don't want to be mistaken for someone who's running at them. You want to put your hands up. Fingers splayed. And they may, if they are there, they may give you a quick pat down. So if you do carry a gun, and you have a concealed permit, just be sure to mention it. My gun's in my purse. My gun's in my back pocket. It's in the holster under my left arm, but I've got a concealed carry permit. You know, just let them just communicate. Be ready to share as much information as you can with law enforcement as you're running out. Shots fired. He was on the fourth floor, but was heading up the stairs to the fifth floor on the east wing, right? Whatever. If you saw what he was wearing, he was wearing camo gear and he had a big heavy vest on and it looked like he was carrying a bunch of stuff in his arms and had a backpack on and a black hat, like whatever you notice. And you may not have seen anything. Only after you are in a safe place, then call 911. Let's talk about hiding. So hiding in this run, hide, fight scenario. Hiding is our second choice. Hiding is an active choice. Have, again, situational awareness. Know where your exits are. Hide in an area that's out of the shooter's view. If you can get behind a door and block the entry, like really block it. Lock the door, barricade it, use thick stuff. If there's a window, try to get stuff up to cover the window, turn the lights out, make yourself quiet. Look for weapons you can use, weapons of opportunity, like a chair, a fire extinguisher. You're in the, you know, the break room and there's a, a pot of hot coffee. So look for those things that you can use. Silence your cell phone, including vibrate mode, and be quiet. Now, if you can't get to a a room where you can shut the door, you can hide in place, but out of view. There's an example of this, but for example, you could hide behind your desk, even if you can't get to a room, because the shooter is also scared. They're having extreme runs of adrenaline, and they are not looking as clearly as they might be. So here's an example of that. The agencies, the law enforcement agencies were... Um, pouring over the security video at the Clackamas Town Center after the shooting there and looking over it and over it again and over it again, just trying to learn whatever they could from that incident. And one time somebody noticed that there was someone hiding behind a very thin post and you could actually see a part of their body, but they kind of blended in with the post. 
And so even though their entire body wasn't hidden, they were never shot at. So even that, like just concealing most of your body can actually save your life. We're going to talk about texting to 911. So if you're hiding and you need to be quiet, you can use your phone, depending on where you're located, to text to 911. So for example, I live on the West Coast. We have a big highway called I-5 that goes south to north and north to south. If you live along that route, chances are pretty good that if you text to 911, they will receive your text message. You may want to check with your non-emergency number and give them a call and find out, you know, in this zip code, if I needed to, could I text you? Would you get my message? Now, if you are in an area and you haven't had a chance to do that and you text to 911 and they can't receive it, a message will bounce back to you immediately that they didn't get it and you'll know you need to call. But when you text to 911, please know that this is what they would like us to do. Start with the exact address or location and say there's an active shooter. Press send. They don't want us doing long paragraphs and then hitting send. They want us to give very short bits of information and just keep hitting send because as quickly as we're sending them information, they're turning around and sharing it. So if you know things like the location of the active shooter, the number of shooters, the physical description of the shooters, which part of the building. If you heard, if you're good at this, like if you actually served in the military, you might know one weapon from another and you can report that. And that is really helpful for the law enforcement to know. If you have a sense for how many people are in the building or if you saw like what area they were in and had a sense that there might have been like around 50 people there. Give them those kinds of numbers. And again, in really short bursts, send, 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 so that they can make choices about how many people they roll out and how many ambulances and all of those things. So that's how we can help by dialing 911. But Let's talk about calling 911. I was asked very recently when I was giving this presentation about the safety of calling 911 for people who are not white, like me, right? And we know, we all know that when police respond, black, indigenous, and people of color get harmed or killed in staggering numbers. So in an active shooter scenario, is it okay to call the police? You know, I think I don't have like a, I'm not God here at all. I don't know. But I think that we need to really talk honestly about this. If there is one lone dude in a building who is ready to die, who is geared up with a bulletproof vest and a helmet and who has automatic weapons and he wants to kill as many people as he can, who else has the training to deal with that? You know, we're there, but who else besides us really has the equipment to handle that type of an attack and assault? I don't know. And again, I think this is something we need to keep talking about. And for God's sake, at the same time, we have to keep actively working towards and pushing towards real justice and equality. What a crappy situation to even have to ask is safe to call 911. But we do have to talk about this because as things are, it's not just, it's not equal, and it's not fair. So I think this is an ongoing conversation that we can have together. I'm open to hearing what you have to say. Deep breath. That also is hard to think about and frustrating and angering, like all of this presentation. But let's talk about fighting. So fighting is our last resort, right? It's run, hide, fight, and in that order for a reason. Fighting is our last resort and only when our life is in imminent danger. We want to have a pack mindset. Right. If we have people with us, we want to use all of our resources. So if I'm in a room with three other people, we're going to make a plan. 
We're going to make a very specific plan. The more specific we can be, the better. And we're going to fight for real 110%. We want to incapacitate the shooter. We want to act with as much physical aggression as possible. We want to improvise weapons or throw items at the shooter like bricks, chairs, fire extinguishers, like we just talked about, hot coffee in the coffee pot, right? And so we're going to attack the weapon. We're going to commit to our actions as if our life depended on it because it does. And we're going to fight until the shooter is still. We're not going to let up until we have control of the weapon and his body. Here's an example. I'm in a room and there are three of us. And so maybe I'm the one who's keeping my head Maybe there are three of us in there and one of us is panicking and the others have have some experience that makes them able to breathe and like really quickly make a plan. So I'm going to go for the guy's head with the fire extinguisher and person number two is going to go for his knees with the big chair and number four is throwing coffee in his face and number five is attacking the weapon and diving on it. Something like that, that's an example of what a fight plan could look like. And it's, again, it's going to depend on where you are, what's going on, how many people you have, how brave everyone is feeling. And that's how this plan is going to unroll. It's going to happen very fast. So even thinking about that can be hard and scary. So let's, again, a little break here, take a deep breath. And we're going to keep going. And um, while you're breathing, I'm going to tell you about Stop the Bleed, which is a great organization, stopthebleed.org. And the research is showing that the highest number of people who die on an active shooter scene die because of loss of blood. It's not necessarily because the bullet went into the heart or the brain but because of bleeding out. And so Stop the Bleed is an organization that trains people specifically how to stop someone from bleeding out. It's great training, and there are videos, and I will link to those. I'll link to their website. There are online trainings. There are in-person trainings. They have kits that they sell, and it's kind of the same as going to CPR class every year and first aid class with the Red Cross, right? Learn how to stop someone from bleeding because active shooter or no, you might be in another situation where your skills could come in handy and you could even tell someone if you're bleeding, no, you need to press on that area. Don't do that. Just press, right? So you can be the person who's helpful in a situation like this. We can all be that person, If we don't feel up to it, we don't have to be, right? This is in our hands. All of this is in our hands. It's in your hands, but it's a resource. I want to talk about Run, Hide, Fight, the video. There are a couple of videos and different organizations have made different videos. I want to just give you a a little warning. The thing that I don't like about the videos is the music. The music seems to me to be designed to scare you and frighten you and get your heart rate up. And... I don't know. There might be some reason why they do that. But to me, it seems like it could be triggering for people. Also, many of them use actual gunshots in the sound, which could also be triggering for some people, um, especially people who may be here in this country because they fled from war and violence. So just to be careful and to think mindfully about what you are up for. Some of the videos use stuff that looks like blood. So the thing that I like about Stop the Bleed, uh, they ha- there are a couple different videos. One is more uh, cartoonish, and I don't say that in like, oh, it's like so silly, but it's um, drawings. It's like animated. So it's uh, less maybe impactful Does that make sense? So it's a little, it can be a little easier to watch because it's drawn instead of real people and it looks like real blood. So again, I'm going to link to all of these things. The videos 
many of them are also have subtitles. So you could, in fact, possibly turn off the sound and just read and watch. Take a deep breath. I want to end here. We're just about wrapping up. I want to um, just share a couple of last kind of final notes with you. The first officers to arrive on the scene will not stop to help those people who have been injured. They will they will have the mission of stopping the shooter. That is their one sole purpose. The rescue teams that follow them, they will be treating and removing the injured people. Just so you know, that's what it's going to look like. Find a safe location to wait. So if you were able to run and get out, get out of the line of sight of the shooter. This might be up to us, too, to help lead a pack of people to a place where it's safe, like around the corner of another building or across the street behind a big fence. So just to keep that in mind. And once we've reached a safe location and once law enforcement arrives, we will likely be held in that area for a while until the situation is under control, until they've had a chance to talk to each of us because they're going to want to debrief each of us because we're witnesses to a crime. They're going to want to just know who we are, get our, you know, our identity stuff. And they're not going to want us to leave the area until everything's really clear. So just so you know that you can expect a waiting period. So when law enforcement arrives, they request that we stay calm, that we follow their instructions, that we drop anything that we did happen to carry with us, like our bag or our jacket, and raise our hands and spread our fingers in that universal sign of, I don't have a weapon, and keep our hands visible at all times. And they ask that we avoid quick movements toward officers like holding on to them or grabbing them and crying and, or screaming or yelling or, you know, out of fear or panic uh, to avoid pointing and to, to not ask them questions because they have a very specific task and they need to stay focused so that everyone gets safe as quickly as possible. And so this is what I wanted to say that maybe we can be the people who are able to stay present because we do practice our breathing. We practice our planning. You know, you've done this. You, you've, you've listened to this episode. You maybe go watch some of the films and get so, the Stop the Bleed training. And you know that you can stay calm and you can portray a sense of calm, and maybe there's someone who needs their hand held. Maybe there's someone panicking who you can help by getting them some water and sitting down next to them and putting your arm around them. Or maybe someone needs a hug, or maybe a group of people need to sit down together and just hold one another. So maybe we can be the people who help that situation stay calm and not panicky. Because you can only imagine that it is such a crazy thing to have gone through that panicking will be a go-to for a lot of people. So a couple of things to mention and then we're done. When you walk into a new building, just think it through. Like you're, it's a new building, just track your path in so you also know and you can recall your path out. This is not just for active shooter scenario, but it's for like a fire drill, your own personal fire drill when you go into an unknown location, right? So you're just paying attention. This is our planning. This is who we are. This is what we do. We're self-defense people. So think through these scenarios and, you know, the movies and the stuff and like talk it through with your family and with your coworkers and what, what would we do if, and what would be our goal if something like this were to happen? What would be our aim? So just to talk about it, which also can take some of the, of the, the fear away by just talking about it. And another suggestion is to know what the sound of shooting sounds like. It's different than on TV. So um, one of the things that I did after I started getting these trainings is I 
went to um, a place. What's it called? Uh, <laughs> uh, one of these places. And I learned how to shoot a gun. And not because I have one, not because I ever want to have one, but because I wanted to hear what it sounded like um, with a shooting range, a firing range. Oh, yeah, like a practice place. So if you feel comfortable with something like that, then that means that when you hear something, you might know the difference between a gun and fireworks because they sound kind of similar. And it's okay to ask, what was that sound? It's okay to walk out if you're not sure. Better safe than sorry. It's okay to run out, even if it could have been a firecracker, right? It's okay to stay safe. Again, let's talk about making fast decisions. It's important to know, just know that you might have to make a decision very quickly and then don't doubt yourself, just follow through. You can reassess it later and change your mind if it looks like, oh, I shouldn't have been running this direction. Run back and run the other way. People like you who have thought about this and have got some sense of this training can make these split second decisions. You can. And these are things we can practice too. Making decisions quickly and not doubting ourselves, not second guessing ourselves, just making a decision and going forward. So that's a way we can practice. Those people who haven't done this training or who haven't thought about this stuff, who haven't talked it over with friends, who haven't made plans, they might fall into denial and they won't want to believe that it's actually happening or it will be like, this can't be happening. And they won't know what to do. So that's when panic sets in and that's where people like us can maybe step in and provide that calm direction since we will know what to do, even though we're going to be scared out of our brains. But we can keep our breathing and know that we can make decisions and move. So think it through, make a plan, practice in your mind. And for goodness sakes, you know what I'm going to say, practice fighting. Go to empowerment self-defense classes. Go take up a martial arts class. Learn how to hit. Learn how to fight. It's empowering and it's really fun and you can do it. Everybody can do it. Really. I believe in you. And, you know, no matter what, no matter what your body looks like, no matter what's going on or how old you are, there are still some things that you can learn how to do that could protect you if you have to fight. So I believe in you. Uh, thank you for hanging with me. This was very hard to talk through. Um, it always is. I'm sure it was hard to listen through. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. And if you're here, I would really appreciate it. This podcast is a labor of love. I would Really appreciate it if you would give me all your stars, review this podcast on whatever platform you use, and help other people find it. Like tell your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors and pass on the word. And if you haven't yet, go back and listen to episode number one and all of the other episodes, especially at the beginning. They kind of cover some really important basic self-defense and empowerment stuff. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you, listeners. You are in my heart. Uh, my hope is that all of us stay safe, that this ongoing discussion of whether or not to call 911 is one that gets resolved quickly, that things change, that we bring justice to our country, to our world, and that we live and breathe in peace, that we become peaceful and share that with others so that this violence, this toxic masculinity, these situations stop happening. We can do it. Um, we can do it together. I love you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. It's affirmation time. This is how I end every self-defense class. It's kind of cheesy, but it's very cool, and this is how it works. We're going to do like a little call and response. If you can say this out loud, if you can repeat after me, D 
do it because it's important, I think, for you to hear your own voice. But if you can't, like if you're on a crowded subway or someplace where it's embarrassing, don't worry. You can also just say it inside your head. Okay, so I'm going to say something and you're going to repeat it after me. I'm going to give you space to do that. And at the end, we're going to say yes. Here we go. Repeat after me. I am worth protecting. I love myself. I belong. I deserve to take up space on planet Earth. I am a strong and powerful person. Yes! Woohoo! And hey, as a wrap up, will you do me a favor? Will you do all the things that you do when there's a podcast? Like, will you tell your friends? Will you subscribe? Will you come back each week, communicate with me, review this podcast? Like, all those things to help get more bandwidth, help more people find out about it. That would be super awesome. Take a deep breath. You are amazing. Thank you for being with me. See you next time.